Welcome to I Have Something to Say. Well, it's my privilege today to welcome Dr. Sharon and Anucci to the show. I'm gonna, gonna call her Sharon, but I'm really intrigued because Dr. Carolyn Horn told me about Sharon. And she said, this is the most influential person that she had come into her life as far as what her career is. So that took me by surprise. And uh, Karen's really smart. And she said, if you think I'm smart, wait till you talk to Sharon. <laughs> so without further ado, let me bring Sharon onto the show. Hi. Hi. Thank I you for see. having me. Well, I'm so excited. And let me get the chats up so we can see it. Okay. We've got some people joining us. Can you see the chats? I can. Good. Hello, everybody. Hi, Carolyn. And <clears throat> Paul and Lynette and Brad. Hi, so Mark. Hi, Yvonne. Oh, Avon Kent Panteras, I just love her. And uh, Michelle, all my friends are have been really excited about this show because I've been bragging on you nonstop. I, you know, I'm a little concerned that, that you and Carolyn didn't manage expectations very well. We did. We did. <laughs> Managed them up, 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 up. <laughs> right, right. And, uh, oh, Hey, salute. How you doing? And so today I just want to get right to the subject because it's too important. Aphasia somewhat sucks. Yes. And for a person that has aphasia and was left unable to talk except for one word, one, one, one. Mm -hmm. And it's a long journey, you know, when you have aphasia, it uh, can be depressing, it can be sad, it can be overwhelming. So how do you, what's your brat, brat, background before you got into aphasia? Tell me a little bit about your life and bring me up to date, how you got interested in aphasia just Sure. So I, the first time that I learned about aphasia um, was when I was an undergraduate. And I had always been interested in things to do with language. And so I started taking linguistics classes. Mm. And one of the assignments in one of my classes was that we had to give a presentation about something that was related Mm -hmm. to linguistics, but that wouldn't be covered in our class. Wow. And I had also always been interested, you know, I'm a big nerd. Um, and I, I was always also interested in brains. I think brains are very cool. Um, and so as I was kind of looking for a, a topic to present on, I came across aphasia and speech language pathology. Mm. And and that kind of was it for me. Wow. You know, I, I felt like this is, this is, this is my, how, you know, how have I managed to find something that is the exact merging of, of these two things I'm so interested in. You know, uh, when, <clears throat> just a funny story. When I uh, was diagnosed with aphasia, I came to uh, St. Pete to uh, get intensive speech therapy lessons. I couldn't really talk, but I decided that I would take around a camera and go interview people mm -hmm. about what aphasia was. Mm -hmm. So I learned this thing. Uh, do you mind if I ask, do you know what aphasia is? And I speak, stick a microphone in their face. So I had interviewed a hundred people. Wow. Four new. Four new. Mm -hmm. I was told aphasia is a small country in Africa. 
I was told if you go two blocks, take a left, turn right, you'll run into aphasia street. I was told it was a menu item on a sushi restaurant. And I was told it was a rap band. Turns out that was true. Really? The guy, the guy that started the rap band, his father had aphasia and he oh, named yeah. it after his father. That's, that's a very cool way, way to get. Through. Yeah, that's a very cool way to get the word out. Was I was just shocked that mm -hmm. people didn't know. Mm -hmm. So what's your take on that and why is not more prevalent right so i think a few things <clears throat> i think that it has to do with the education that the medical community gets mm. and the priorities of the medical community which to a certain extent are understandable um you know when someone has a stroke the, the priorities often are, can they walk? Can they get themselves around safely? Mm. And can they eat? Can they, can they swallow and oh, eat? Me too. Yeah. Exactly. Safely. Um, and I think that people don't think of how kind of integral to someone's life being able to communicate is, you know, and so it's just not prioritized. And then because of that, you get this, this vicious cycle where because a lot of medical professionals don't know about it, they don't know how to, to manage it and talk about it when, when they have a patient in front of them who's dealing with it. You know, we talked about it uh, before the show when I was in the hospital. My, uh, my kids were all gathered around mm -hmm. and... Uh, my uh, doctor, neurologist, by accident, I just was airlifted to a hospital. And, uh, and he said to my kids, she, uh, he's never going to talk again or limited. Um, and he uh, probably not going to read, probably not going to write. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, I was shocked that the doctor said that. Mm -hmm. So I took my pen and threw it at his head. And my son said, I think he wants you to leave. Because I was just shocked that they were giving up on me so quick. Right. Right. Setting like the bar so low. Right. I'm, you know, I'm not taking a shot at doctors. I went back to that hospital, mm -hmm. by the way. Right. I talked to that doctor and I said, I can talk. Right. I can read. Mm -hmm. I can write because I taught myself and many other speech therapists helped me learn mm -hmm. to talk. Don't ever rob hope from another person as long as you live, please. Right. And I had that conversation. Yeah. And I think you know, we were talking before about kind of being an extrovert and being brave. I, you know, I think that's a, a very brave thing to do. Um, and I think, you know, there are probably people who've had the same exact experience, probably a lot of people who, you know, maybe because they're angry, maybe because they're frustrated and they think, why bother? Yeah. You know, who don't go back to their doctors and tell them that. And I really hope that your doctor changed from I that experience so. i hope so but yeah. you know i don't know but the nurses were really glad to see me because they were shocked one of the things that um, they related to me is it's good you you came back we don't hear enough about success stories like yours right right and right. they you know sat down and talked to me and i said uh, one nurse in particular said, Paul, I can't believe you can talk. How did you do this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I said, practice, more practice, more practice, mm -hmm. and a lot more practice. And then right. if I got confused, I just practiced some more. 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, right. So, so how important is the mind, mindset in recovery <laughs> from aphasia? I think it's, I think it's everything. Wow. You know, I really, I think it's everything because that will influence every other aspect of your recovery. Um, you know, and, and I recognize that that is easy for me to say, you know, it's much easier said than done. Right. You know, because you know, you're, you're living with frustration with anger, with, with, mm. I mean, really mourning in a way. Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm telling you the first seven weeks, mm -hmm. I didn't have a speech lesson at all, by the way, I didn't right. know where to go. I didn't know what to do. Right. But the fact that I was left alone, mm -hmm. like not physically alone in my mind to right. process all <clears throat> that, Right. I was angry. I was depressed. I was sad. I was overwhelmed. And I taught this stuff for 37 years about mm -hmm. mindset for 37 right. years. I couldn't find my way to mindset. <laughs> right. right. And, you know, I think <clears throat> having patience with yourself is critical, um, and, you know, and getting back to the point about the, you know, what, what a lot of people unfortunately hear from their doctors, <clears throat> you know, I wonder sometimes if it's because doctors, you know, number one, don't necessarily know, but number two are afraid to over promise. Yep. You know, or make that. guarantees. Um, and so, you know, I, and I think this is true for everyone. <clears throat> Only, you know, using yourself as your barometer, you know, not mm -hmm. saying I have to be just like Paul or my recovery is going to look just like his or if my recovery doesn't look just like his, I've failed or I'm not good enough. Yep. You know, I think I that that's a lot. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, I love what you said. Uh, having patience with yourself is so important because I didn't have patience. I was just overwhelmed. I was just anxious and was, was my mom that got me back on site. She called me and sent me a video and said, look at this guy, mm -hmm. Dr. Tom Bruce Hart. He had a stroke. Mm -hmm. And I watched that video and watched that video and watched that video. And I said, he, he, if he can do it, I can do it too. Mm -hmm. That gave me a glimpse, right. a glimpse right. of recovery. That's all I needed. Just mm -hmm. to tell me I can get better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, right. right. So, so you think it's important that you have your mind wide, but how do we get there? So that's the million dollar question. That's why I'm asking you because you're so <laughs> smart. <laughs> um, I think, you know, you had asked me um, or you had mentioned that one of the things you wanted to touch on was um, was plateaus. And yeah. I think that I think that this is what we're talking about now is very similar yeah. to that yeah. <clears throat> in that I don't think there's any one answer. I think, you know, you have to, and I have to, you know, who am I to mandate? Things to think to consider are, you know, what, you know, what is making you feel the way that you feel? Is it just exhaustion, you yes. know, that you just need to give yourself a break? Is it, you know, that you're getting into this cycle of comparing yourself to other people? Is it that, you know, you're dealing with depression, which is completely understandable. And in some cases is because of, you know, certainly it's because of what's happened to your brain, but for some people, because of where they've had their stroke in their brain, yeah. it's even, it's, it's made even worse. 
Um, is it that, you know, as we were talking about before, what you're, what you're working on is so boring Yep. or you don't know why you're supposed, you know, you don't know why it's supposed to be helping, you know, that you just have no motivation to do it. You know, that's really interesting, uh, Sharon, because <laughs> I believe like I, the thing I wanted more than anything, was to learn my creed that I talked mm -hmm. to millions of people mm -hmm. and I just wanted it back. And I didn't want to uh, uh, study a flashcard that I wanted my creed back. I wanted my uh, way of talking back. I wanted my to learn my affirmations that I shared with many other people. I wanted to learn passion prevails when everything else fails. Do the thing you fear and the death of fear is certain. And I just wanted to learn what I wanted to right. talk about again. Right. When I decided to that, that be my direction. Mm-hmm. I was so intrigued. I became my own speech advocate mm -hmm. for getting better. Right. And I was <laughs> hell bent on getting mm -hmm. better. So uh, people that are taught in a boring way don't learn very much. I, I mean, I certainly think that, you know, and the other thing is <clears throat> some of it is going to be influenced by, you know, just your personality. Yeah. Right. Um, not, not everyone is, is so gregarious and so, you know, willing to put themselves out there. You, you're going to, you're going to be shocked. You ready? I'm ready. I'm an introvert. Uh, see, I would have never guessed. I'd love to teach, but my, my hobbies, I like to paint. Mm -hmm. I like to read. Uh, I, you know, I love to teach lit on fire. Right. <laughs> but, but I, I think I'm more in the, of an amniavert mm -hmm. balance between extroverted mm -hmm. and introverted. So, right. so anyway, people don't believe that, but <laughs> I am. So, no, I guess it has more to do with how you, you know, recharge your battery. Yeah. Then how you present yeah, yourself. That's what I'm going to school and making notes. So go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. It's how you recharge yourself. Good. So how do you, how does a person that's unable to talk or not very much and they have limited speech lessons and they're over. Mm -hmm. I believe anybody can learn to talk again. Just we have to practice. I I agree. And I think, you know, you had asked me or you had mentioned earlier, you know, how, how much is too much? Yes. Practice. Yeah. Um, I, I want to know that because I, I practice a lot. Yeah. So I think I think there the answer is there's no such thing as too much practice. I do think that there is practicing in a not helpful way. Okay. Tell me about that. Okay. Um, so, you know, one thing that, that science is starting to show us uh, is that for, for many people, they remember information better. And this includes people with aphasia if they space their practice out rather than kind of clumping it together. Yes. And that makes sense, right? You know, if you think about, you know, many of us probably crammed for exams at some point yeah. in our lives, you know, and you, you try to do nothing but memorize and you don't think about the connections between things and you don't use the information except on the test you just kind of dump it all out and it's not really yours, right? You don't own it. Exactly. Yeah. Whereas if you space 
the learning out, the practicing out a little bit, um, you give your brain time to work on it. Can I uh, run some uh, scenarios by you? Sure. So I believe in, uh, I've taught this all my life before mm -hmm. I had my stroke. Mm -hmm. uh, 20 minute drills, take a break, get away, refresh, breathe, come mm -hmm. back, 20 minutes more drills. So I, I take the time to practice 20 minutes at a time. Mm -hmm. Really hard though. Right. I use drills. I use uh, word associations. I talk in funny voices. I talk louder. I talk softer. I sing. And, yeah. but 20 minutes all out, then I take a break. Mm hmm Mm -hmm. and get away from it. My retention level has gone through the roof. And, you know, uh, I started with one word. My second word was two weeks later. It was sock. And I was so proud. One sock, one sock, one sock. I called everybody I knew and said, I doubled my vocabulary. One sock, one sock. To adding 30,000 words to my vocabulary and, uh, 31 months. That's a, that's amazing. It's outstanding. Well, I don't, I, I don't, I don't say them all clearly at all. Well. <laughs> that's what I'm saying so, but I'm, I'm not bragging on myself. I'm just telling you that 20 minute drill when I was practicing nonstop, mm -hmm. I would overwhelming myself. Right. And I, one thing ran to another, it got cluttered mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I couldn't find any space. So uh, do you believe in drills or do you believe what's your take on uh, what I should do, what any of us should do that has aphasia and um, about getting better? Well, I think you should just keep doing what you're doing <laughs> because it's clearly working very well. Um, and I think, I think that, you know, to get back to that timing issue for a minute, it, you know, it may be that 20 minutes, you know, we don't know yet what's the, the, the optimal amount yeah. of time. And it may well be that 20 minutes is, is it for you yeah. or someone else. It might be 10. For someone else, it might be 30. I think you have to give yourself permission to be flexible. Wow. Um, and great point. And you also mentioned that, you know, it sounds like the way that you're practicing, you've made it fun for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, different people that that, you know, making it fun for themselves might look differently than it does for you. But you know, my feeling is, and I, again, this I think is true for everyone in some way, is I'd rather see a good 10 minutes than a bad hour. Exactly. That's so important. So smart. And by the way, you know, if you meet one person with aphasia, you met one person with aphasia. That's They're right. all different. That's they right. all have a different learning style. They accept information differently. There's no one way to train. Right. One way to teach. That's right. And and that gets back also to the, I think, the idea of not comparing your journey to somebody else's. You know, that's been the age old story forever. Yeah. With people don't don't have aphasia. Somebody right. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Always social comparison theory. Yes. Dangerous business to get in, you know. Yes. And I, you know, as much as social media is wonderful yeah. for aphasia, like what you're doing, it it can also be, you know, exacerbate that comparison. You know, yeah. because we all we all choose what we show everybody. Right? Uh. Good point. You snuck that <laughs> one in on me. How do you, how do you uh, select a good speech therapist for you? That is a great question. Mm 
Um, I think, so certainly there are places that you can go on the internet that will give you suggestions for speech therapists who have a particular theory okay. or a particular approach that maybe you feel like melds well with, with what you want to do. Um, so as an example, I'm going to do a little plug. Um, there's a group of, hey. there's a group of, of clinicians um, and people with aphasia who started a group called aphasia access. Okay. Aphasia access. Yes. Okay. And that is a group of clinicians and researchers who are working on or who work using an approach known as the life participation approach, wow. which is really about, you know, providing strategic treatment, it, you know, to give people the tools that they need to, to kind of get back to whatever in their life is important yeah. to them. We all want our independence back. <laughs> exactly. Um, but also to think about how to, not just give them the tools to access the opportunities, but how to, to create those opportunities. Really? So mm -hmm. uh, how do we get uh, in touch with those people? So they have a website. Um, am, do I have um, a way to add to the chat? I don't know, but go slowly. The website is? Okay. So aphasia. Aphasia. Okay. Same word, access. Access. Okay. Dot org. I believe. That's, I'm going to check. That's right. Aphasia.org. Aphasia access. And dot aphasia. org. Exactly. Okay. I put it in the chat. Good. That's it. Yep. Good. That's it. So... So we can reach out and get some information and find it about good. So yeah. Carolyn did it too. <laughs> Carolyn, way to stand tall. Help her out. <laughs> <laughs> so, Poor Carolyn has done more transcribing for me than she ever. She is, she is wonderful. Yeah. She can take an idea, <laughs> just... <laughs> Expand it over and over again. You did a good job, uh, you know. Oh. She was, <laughs> you know, I, I love Carolyn for one reason. I'm telling you beforehand, her heart. Yes. It's uh, so amazing. I wish everybody in the speech therapy lesson uh, in industry was like Carolyn. It would be a much better world if they were so. That's a little plug for my friend, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> How about, what's the thing with the animal assisted therapy? <laughs> Look at that smile. <laughs> Tell me about that. So we were, so we were talking before about, you know, what everyone has their, their hook, right? Their thing that is most important to them. Oh, there's my angel. Uh -huh. He's my love of my life. Oh, I'm not, not going to tell your husband. <laughs> oh, he knows. He knows. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, animals and, and certainly probably dogs specifically have been a love of mine my whole life. Okay. And... It's been going on for a while now that people have started talking about animal assisted therapy and the 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 benefits of interacting with animals. And there's there's a lot of evidence for the cardiovascular benefits mm -hmm. of interacting with animals. And they're starting to be more um, more, you know, information about kind of the social benefits um, and one woman who I, I, whose work I very much admire, one thing that she said was that animals promote the preconditions for learning. 
Ah, oh, no, let me write that. Um, animals promote the preconditions for learning. Hmm. And you, what what she, so what she meant by that was it's difficult to learn for everybody mm -hmm. when you're stressed mm -hmm. and when you're anxious and when you are depressed. Mm. And animals help to alleviate that. Wow. You know, being in the presence of an animal who is non-judgmental, uh. you know, which is very important, yep. um, you know, helps to reduce, you know, physically helps to reduce, you know, stress hormones, helps to reduce, you know, blood pressure, you know, all of those things can help to put you back to mindset in a place where you're more ready to to receive whatever information you're trying to learn. Oh. Um, so in my words, that the reduction of stress and the fact that you're in a better mood and somewhat enthusiastic, excited about playing with the dog, promotes learning because <laughs> the intake of information is better received in that way. It, That's what some of the evidence is starting to show, yes. Yeah. And, and any of us who have dogs in our lives, you know, that, that kind of makes sense. Exactly. So yeah. tell me about the program and what, uh, what are you doing with it? I just really intrigued. I've never heard about that from a aphasia standpoint. So I really excited to, uh, learn more. So, um, you know, it, it all goes back to having a good mentor. And I, I struggled for a long time with how to, to incorporate what, you know, work with dogs into <clears throat> kind of traditional aphasia therapy mm -hmm. in a, in a novel way. Um, you know, and what one, uh, you know, one of my best ever mentors said to me was, well, maybe it doesn't have to be that way. Maybe, you know, maybe you can think outside the box a little bit. And then I, and then I, through, through my own work with my own dog and through work with shelter dogs, I started learning more and more about um, what's called positive reinforcement training. Okay. Um, which is a way of working with a dog. Um, you know, you can train them to do different, you know, skills and, what have you. Um, and the way that that training works really works your mind. You know, you have to plan, you have to problem solve. Um, you have to think about, you know, you have to self monitor and think about, well, what did I do that worked? What am I doing that's not working? So it's a good well, workout for your it's, brain. It's stimulating all those accesses to the brain. Yes. That makes it better when yes. you have aphasia yes. because I can remember, I know you won't laugh at me. I can remember going to uh, the grocery store when I first had my stroke, that mm -hmm. was an overwhelming yes. situation. Yes. I walked and walked and walked and walked trying to find four items. Right. I couldn't talk, scared to ask because mm -hmm. I didn't want to be felt stupid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's another subject for another day. I would like to have you back on to talk about that because people that have aphasia go through a lot. A oh, lot. yes. And I, 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 it's one of the things that I hate to hear, but that so many people with aphasia say is, oh, I'm so stupid. Well, and it's hard. It's, it's, it, it, they're not. They're not. And I never felt like I was stupid, but I had people treat me like I was stupid. Right. It's, it's disconcerting. 
<laughs> now right. that I can talk, I love to educate those people in a, a fun way. Right. So, uh, but when I was walking around that grocery store, I wish I had the ability to problem solve, plan. Mm -hmm. So anything that can help with that is really good. So tell me more about that. Do you have a center or just? So we started the, and the one other thing I will say is the nice thing about this program is that even for, for people with aphasia who really have a lot of trouble getting their words out, mm -hmm. they can still be in the program because dogs yeah. don't care. Ah, good you know, point. They, they, don't care. They, they, they care about your tone of voice. They care about, you know, your facial expression. You know, they don't care if you make a mistake with your sounds. Um, and so people wow. can choose to practice, you know, with doing talking or not. Um, but so anyway, the program started as an activity of the Moss Rehab Aphasia Center, where I work. Can you say that again? The sure. The Moss Rehab okay. Aphasia Center. Where are you located? We're right outside Philadelphia. Okay. Boy, the Philly... NFL Phillies fired the coach. And I know. I know. Doug Peterson. <laughs> well, I say I know, but I really have no idea. <laughs> well, like Laura. So um, uh, tell me so, about the center. So, yeah. So the center is, um, the center was founded in 1996 by the amazing Myrna Schwartz and Ruth Fink. Ah. Um, I am I am just the the lucky recipient um, and it was built on the, that idea of the life participation approach. Okay. Um, you know, so we have, we have conversation groups, we have book club, um, we have games groups. Wow. Um, and it's a place where, and certainly there are other places like this where people are willing to let you think outside the box. Yeah. Um, and so it started out, the program started as an activity of the center. And now once it's safe, you know, COVID wise, um, we've gotten a research grant to, oh, to study good. it. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank I'm you. I'm so proud. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I am. I just, I, I love talking to uh, enthusiastic people and I love, the fact your your passion comes through <laughs> on this screen. I, I'm telling you, it comes <laughs> through and I can feel it. And uh, that's transferable. Oh, Carolyn, watch. Look at that. I tell I'm telling you. Woo <laughs> 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 woo, Carolyn. <laughs> Raise the roof. That's right. <laughs> So tell me a bit more about this conversation groups that you do or anything that that I can learn from. I really um, I I came here as a student today. Well, so did I. So did I. Oh. <laughs> no, it's true. Uh, that same that same mentor that I mentioned earlier, you know, another thing that she said is and I kind of said this to you earlier, I can't take credit for it. Um, you know, speech pathologists and researchers, you know, we're the experts in kind of the book knowledge, but people living with aphasia are the real aphasia experts. Um, and I think that's part of why aphasia groups, like a conversation group, okay. can be so powerful because yes you know, there, there's a clinician there who's, who's, you know, providing education, who's providing support, you know, to people who need it, um, helping, you know, think about what strategies make the most sense for, for different people. <clears throat> but ultimately it's about people with aphasia being together and, and learning from and supporting each other. 
It's so important. We uh, started a group uh, I did called Happy Hour. We uh, have it every Wednesday at five and it's grown and grown and grown and just a good place for people with aphasia, with mm -hmm. people with stroke, with traumatic brain injury and the caregivers mm -hmm. as well. Right. Just a nice place to have a conversation. Uh, we did a book, we, a book report. We talked about our favorite movies, what we learned from that. We talked about what was the most uh, embarrassing thing that ever happened when you have aphasia. <laughs> that was a lot. <laughs> so, but this is a good place to get together and right. commonality of purpose. Yes. Commonality yeah. of vision, commonality of mission. We all want to improve. We all want to get better. We all want to provide an uplift to others. Right. Uh, we right. pray for each other. We do, um, we have happy birthday songs. We just a good thing. And I just love it. And uh, so that's uh, really important. So what other things? things do you offer at the Moss Rehab Convention? Um, so we, we have a number of those. We have our book club. We have, um, a, when we're able, when we were able to be in person, we did what we called um, a games group. Ah. Um, and we've kind of transitioned that for while we're virtual. Yeah. Um, to what we call the variety hour. Ah, wow, variety. <laughs> what do you do? Um, variety we we sometimes we do we do singing and music. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we do um, art show. People take us on a tour of their house and show us their oh, their I art like or their photos. Um, I took everybody, I used to live in New York, so I took everybody on a virtual tour up Fifth Avenue. Uh-uh. <laughs> yeah, so we do all sorts of things. Where have I been? <laughs> <laughs> We'd love to have you. Hey, Carolyn, you didn't tell me <laughs> well, to be a part of this. It's so fun. Uh, one of the things, do you think that singing works? Yes. You know, I, uh, I went into uh, my center that I attended and uh, walked into the, uh, the, the person that ran the center. I said, I, I wish you had song therapy. Mm -hmm. And she said, uh, it doesn't work. And I said, well, it's working for me. It doesn't work. You're filling your mind to think it works. It doesn't work. And I just was deflated mm -hmm. at that very moment. But mm -hmm. so I walked outside and I said, huh, it works for me. <laughs> right. Who, who is, you know. It How does she know me. what works for you? I don't know. I just, I, I, I'm telling or you, she, she shut me down. It doesn't work. And uh, it's just, I believe music is the universal language. I could sing before I could talk. Right. And, and so there, you know, there, again, there are the psychosocial aspects of music there, but there's also, uh, and this goes back a long time. Um, there are speech therapy programs that are designed based on the fact that, <clears throat> you know, for most people who have aphasia, they had their stroke on their left side. Um, and so incorporating some of the skills of the right side of the brain, mm -hmm. including, yeah. ri including rhythm and, and those kinds of things can help with speech output. Well, syncopated cadence works. Mm -hmm. Right. And you, and if you sing, you use inflection, you right. sing, use syncopated cadence, melodic yeah. overtones, mm -hmm. all of that. I I learned to speak in phrases by singing. Right, right. 
And there's even a, a treatment that's called melodic intonation therapy. Are you kidding? I swear. <laughs> I swear. And it's it's been around for quite a long time, de de developed by um, a, a, an extremely smart and wonderful scientist clinician. Who knew? Because I didn't know, but I, yep. you know, I just love the fact that you can take a song, mm -hmm. break it down into phrases, sing with uh, one level in inflection, drop it down and sing it in a lower octave mm -hmm. and take it up and down, up and down, phrase the cadence, and all of a sudden you can talk. Right. And it just was amazing to me. I, I just, I, I love the exploratory thing about neuroplasticity. The mind is so amazing. I love the brain. I love the connection of the heart and brain that, you know, the, the thing I can uh, think about, anything that... Uh, I was told would be crazy actually worked. You know, you right. can't do that, but it worked for me. Right. And uh, I, half of it is believing it's going to work. I I definitely think so. I, and, and, you know, the flip side being if someone tells you it's not going to work and you believe that, then... It, Exactly. Yeah. 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 And, you know, I don't, <clears throat> you know, with anything, with animal assisted therapy, with music therapy, again, not, it's not one size fits all, right? Exactly. Different music is going to engage different people. Yeah. Um, you know, different, again, people who have their stroke in different parts of their brain are maybe going to be able to access it differently. Um, you know, if people, some people, I don't understand how this works, but some people apparently don't like dogs. So then they well, shouldn't I, do I that. Don't know assistant therapy. How that could be true. I man. know. I know. It's, it seems a little bit ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you, uh, I think it's safe to say you love dogs. I think it's safe to say I'm obsessed with dogs. <laughs> 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 you know, um, I am so uh, honored to be able to talk to you uh, because I want to, I just want to learn. Do you believe people post-stroke 10 years, mm -hmm. post-stroke five years, post-stroke 20 years can still learn? I do. I don't just believe it. I know it. I've seen it. I've seen the evidence. I've, you know, okay. I've, I've seen people, <clears throat> as you say, 12 years after their stroke starting, you know, because they've, you know, not, not just sitting at home watching television. And I love television. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if you start, if you put in the effort and you expose yourself, then yes, I have no, there is no question in my mind that no matter how long it's been, you can see change and you can improve. Is Let there a guarantee how much? No. No. You know, there's no guarantee because what intrigues me, that's my uh, Lisa Brown is one of my favorite people and she works so hard and she's saying, help me because she wants to talk better. Mm -hmm. And I, I I'm going to get uh, your, uh, anyway, I'll get in touch with Lisa because I believe that no two people can learn the same or have it at the same pace. Right. Sometimes it takes a lot of work and all of a sudden the sprockets come together and it fits all of a sudden less incoming learning, you know, right. And you don't know what you don't know, but doing nothing doesn't work. Right. 
Right. <laughs> right. Very and I think and that's true for anything. Exactly. You know, um, I, you know, I, I kind of, I like to use the analogy of going to the gym, which I don't do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I did this morning. Laura worked my butt off this morning. So. <laughs> um, you know, no one would expect that if they only went to the gym once a week and worked with the trainer, no one would expect that that much effort would really change anything. Yep. But sometimes people think, well, I went to speech therapy. Uh, so why, you know, isn't that, and for, I believe me, every, every speech pathologist wishes that it were so, but it's, but it's not, you know, you, you do know, have to keep trying and sometimes it's, you know, trying something different. Exactly. And sometimes it's being open. Um, you know, some people with aphasia don't just have aphasia. They have motor speech problems. Yeah, I do. That make, that make it even that much harder for them to talk. I had but motor make, apraxia, dysarthria. Exactly. And, uh, aphasia. And I was just, I, I couldn't even say my son's name uh mm -hmm. carolyn pointed out to me i said um was ryan i mm -hmm. was saying why and why and why because uh, i took the or bore and put it in the middle or ryan bore or ryan bore mm -hmm. or ryan bore and then i separated i could say ryan but took me forever and she taught uh said to me that was an actual technique yes i didn't know that <laughs> yes well you you didn't go to school to be a speech therapist exactly. <laughs> <I didn't. laughs> um you know and so there are those kinds of things there's also <clears throat> working on maybe working on spelling for a little while yes and getting better at writing you know if you feel like you've hit a little bit of you need a break from working on you know, the, 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 the speech for a little while. Can I ask you a question? How, how do you uh, develop? I love to read. I get, to be honest with you, I get so frustrated reading because mm -hmm. I was an avid reader, like right. 5,000 books in my library. Avid. Right. <laughs> and I just sped read, through books, remember mm -hmm. every word. I can quote any paragraph from any book I ever read mm -hmm. on recall. I can talk backwards and forwards, funny thing. But when I had aphasia, and I still do, I struggle with reading. How would you suggest people begin to, there's there an exercise that you, can suggest or anything? So, you know, very similar to the way that there are different kinds of aphasia, mm -hmm. there are different kinds of trouble with reading and spelling. Ah. Um, so for some, what works for one person might not work for the other. Got it. For some people, they, it, it, they really have to work at the single word level and kind of memorize the words. For other people, it's it's not so much about the individual words as it's about getting themselves to a speed where it's slow enough that they can kind of take the words in, but it's not so slow that by the time you get to the end of the page, you don't remember what was at the That's top. That's what uh, I enjoy a good read, but can't remember anymore. My short term memory is all but gone. And it's uh, just aphasia is a tough business. It's a tough it really business. is. You know, and I think th mm -hmm. there are there are good um, apps for working on for working on everything, but certainly for working on reading and spelling. Um, there are, Lingraphica has something that's really cool, yeah, the talk path. I love that. 
Yeah. I love that too. Um, putting the cat, you know, and these are just, you know, suggestions, um, not evidence-based necessarily, but, you know, put the captions on while you're watching television. Yes. You know, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, One other thing. Um, do you mind talking about um, what do you say to a person that's about to give up? Please don't. Yeah. And, you know, and let's, how can I help you, again, kind of think about why you're ready to give up? Is it, is it, you know, um, because you're not feeling good about yourself because you're again, comparing yourself to somebody else. Is it because you're just exhausted and you need, you need to, you need a break from thinking about aphasia all the time. <laughs> um, yes. is it, you know, is it because you're dealing with depression? Is it because the speech therapist that you're working with or, you know, it, you're just not clicking? you know, or, you know, you don't understand why you're doing what you're doing. Um, you know, it's okay to ask questions. Yeah. Um, you know, is it because <clears throat> you, you just need some support, you know, again, from people who, as much as we want to and try to, if you don't have aphasia, you, you're never going to completely understand what it's like, you know, and so maybe we'll, you know, being with other, you know, getting hooked up with other people with aphasia, yeah. you know, will, will that help motivate you? You know, the reason I ask, I, I get emails all the time, mm -hmm. all the time that people just say things like, I can't take it anymore, or what's the use? Mm -hmm. And I believe that you're the use. You're uh, the use. Absolutely. God saved you for something. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe that it's hard. And it, you know, when I was so depressed early on in my uh, stroke, I was uh, contemplating all types of things because my although my mind was strong my mind wasn't right and it can be both mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely you know and I, yeah and yeah. i think you i think you've hit the nail on the head in that <clears throat> sometimes feeling people are feeling a lot of pressure from from others exactly um and you can i think and this isn't just for people with aphasia. I think this is anyone. You can't do it for someone else. Bingo. That's what I wanted to get to the point. You have to want to for you. Mm -hmm. You be you. Understand who you are. Be true to yourself and stay unique. Because you be you. And right. uh, you're great at being you. Right. You know, You're the best at being you. Exactly. You know, <laughs> and so I uh, believe that it, aphasia is uh, so misunderstood by so many people. Mm -hmm. And when you try to explain it to somebody, they don't really get it. Right. And it takes time. So we have to exercise patience with ourselves. Also, we need to exercise patience with the caregivers that yes. caring for us. Yes. They're going to it too, double time. Yes. They care when you're hurt. Right. And they care about hurting themselves. You know, it's a double edged sword. So I really, uh, uh, Chad said hello from the UK, uh, <laughs> Sherry and, uh, we had a lot of people uh, join us today. I, I can't thank you enough. Uh, 
we've come to the end of this show. It, it's been an hour. I can't believe it. <laughs> um, I just um, love your heart too. And I love your knowledge and I love, uh, I would like to have you back on the show um, if again sometime because we need this. We need this from you, Sharon. Uh, you have a wonderful insight. I can tell that you're passionate, enthusiastic, and uh, just thank you, thank you, thank you for uh, sharing uh, what your breadth of knowledge is. Uh, so many people have been touched by this conversation, and I just can't help but say thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me, and 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 thank you for everything that you're doing. I would it, love to talk to you sometime offside about what I'm doing. You know, um, I'm doing um, aphasia to aphasia talk. That's it. And I'm yeah. just trying to teach people how to talk. I'm not a speech therapist. I don't claim to be. I just love to help people learn how to talk. And um, it's uh, the least I can do. It brings me so much joy. Yeah. And I, I don't, I, I don't think there's, there's no one right way. And if it's, if it's working and it's helping, then, then you're doing the right thing. Oh, thank you so much for <laughs> saying that. Uh, somebody asked, can you repost this session? Uh, when we uh, put it online, you can share it. Absolutely. Well, parting words. Keep tell doing what you're doing. Tell us something that we need to hear and don't know. <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh oh. Um, well, I don't know if you know it or not, but I hope you know it. You're, you're, you're great. And you're, you're doing an amazing thing. All, you know, everyone who's, who participates in your program, you know, you're, you're making a contribution and that oh, thank you. that's all any of us, you know, can hope to do. You know, I just love to teach, loved it all my life. Teaching is hard work, not hard work. Yes. Teaching is hard work. Yes. And I love to teach and uh, no greater joy than seeing that uh, that thing, that awareness come on in somebody's eyes. I got this. I got this. Mm -hmm. And uh, just so important. So thank you. We always say hope is on the way because it is. And be hopeful, not hopeless. And um uh, if you'll stay online, I'm going to say goodbye and you can say goodbye uh, for all of us and uh, bless you for being on my show. Thank you so much. Hang in tight. I'll see you on morning coffee Tuesday morning. Terrific Tuesday. See you then.